Irmãos, a paz do Senhor. Nós vamos colocar de pé. My brother, peace of the Lord. We're going to stand up. We're going to book, uh, open the, the book of Luke. Luke. 22. 25. 25. 25. Então, 22. Mateus 22. Mateus 22. You're already there in Luke. Yeah, we didn't finish Matthew already in Luke. This is something that Ronaldo came up with. The son. The father is a, is a good one. Matthew 20. 22. Matthew 22. Chapter 22. <coughs> Amen. I'm going to bring this back here. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parable and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent to his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened calf are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their way, one to his own farm, another for his, to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treat, threatened them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard of, about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murders, and burned up their, their cities. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as uh, many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all those they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw men there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servant, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and garnish of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Amen. The brethren may be seated. A brethren. Those parables. They are all interconnected. The last few chapters of Matthew, they show to us the last days of Jesus on earth, the last hours of Jesus on earth. We know that Jesus lived here for how many years? How many years? 33 years. And from those 33 years, he set aside three years for the ministry, 10%. Here, you already have a teaching to us. Everything that God gives us, we need to set aside what is, what belongs to the Lord. Why? Because it's not for the church, but it is for the Lord, what is God's. Everything that we receive, it is not, it is not our own merit. If you think that you work every week and your boss there write uh, the, the check of 500, 800, 1,000 or more, you think that this is your merit? You are mistaken. The merit is the Lord's. Because if we're not for the Lord, firstly, we would not have a job. 
Secondly, you wouldn't have health in order to fulfill all your commitments with your uh, employer. So everything that we have, every honor and glory needs to be given to the Lord. So then Jesus here, he after three years there, destined to the ministry, going to this through the cities of Israel and going to Jerusalem and the neighboring areas of Jerusalem, preaching, healing, feeding the people, speaking, introducing a new kingdom. Now, on his last hours, he noticed that man, the Israelite, was not ready to receive what he had come to deliver to men, which was salvation by faith, salvation by grace, grace, no longer salvation through the law. Jesus didn't come at all to cancel the law. No, he came, he fulfilled the law, and after that, he gave man the right, the means for man to go to God without human effort. And that's why he comes to introduce to man. The new kingdom that Jesus came to bring was exactly this. It was to remove from the man's mind that if you keep this, if you don't eat that, if I help the poor, or if I give uh, an alms, if I'm a good father, I'm a good man, I'm going to heaven. Salvation is given to man through Jesus. So now, on his last days, Jesus now begins to he begins telling uh, a series of parables, explaining to people. Firstly, he answers on, on chapter 21. All those chapters 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, they are, all those chapters, they are interconnected. Firstly, he enters in chapter 21 in Jerusalem in a way that he never had never entered before. Every time that Jesus presented himself to men, until then, he would heal people, and then what would he say? Hey, don't tell anyone. Keep this for yourself. Keep this to yourself and go away. How many times did Jesus did that? He healed the ten leopard, two returned, and he said, Go there to present yourself to the priest and go away. Don't tell anyone. Actually, it was one. <laughs> it was inflation. <laughs> it was just one that returned. He now, when he goes back to Trenton, to Jerusalem, for the last time, you know, what does he do? He comes, he speaks to the disciples and says, go there, you find a do donkey, young donkey, and then you bring here and inform the people that I'm, I am arriving. Chapter 20 says exactly that and, and tell them, chapter 21. 21.5 Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a coat the full, full of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and, and the coat laid their coat on them and set him on them. And very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the, street, the trees and spread them on the road. So then Jesus enters into Jerusalem, presenting himself as a king, the Messiah. The so greatly awaited Messiah now is arriving. And 
the people, they loved it. Why? Because they could not withstand anymore the dependency to Rome. They wanted to get delivered from the Roman Empire. They wanted to have, once again, the freedom of having their own government and not being under the power of another uh, nation. But Jesus didn't come the way man was expecting him to come. Firstly, when the king, when the king came and introduced himself to people, he, he was usually would be riding on a white horse as a symbol of strength, symbol of power, symbol of authority. The kings they normally would ride on white horses, but Jesus came riding on. A little donkey as a symbol of humbleness and a symbol of peace. I didn't come to deliver war, but I came to deliver peace. That's why when he introduced to the, himself to the disciples, he said, Peace be with you. But the Jewish people didn't understand this. They, they were saying, Hosanna to the Son of David, glory to God. They began to glorify God because of the arrival of the Messiah. But when Jesus enters into the temple, instead of entering into the palace, there was a great disappointment for the crowd. In the sequence here, he enters into the temple. He doesn't go to the palace to present himself to Herod, to kick Herod out, take your crowd, your entourage out, because I arrived and now we are going to have a different kingdom. No. He went to the temple, and in the temple, he kicked out who? the ones who were buying and selling, the merchants that were in the temple. He didn't, he didn't go to the king, to the castle, to... to uh, Jesus didn't have anything to do with the politics. What Jesus came was the government from God, a government that had been rejected by Israel at the very beginning, when the people want to be like the other nations, when they requested a king from God. When they set aside the kingdom of God and requested a king, and then Saul came. And that's how it began. Every time man does this, we see this in our life. We see in the world that we see, in which we are. The world today ignores God's voice, push aside everything that is related to eternity, everything that is from God, in schools, you can no longer preach the gospel. It is this and that. You cannot do this. You cannot even... You, if you preach to someone at work, you can, you can be reproached by your boss. The situation now is very difficult. In schools, you, you cannot write down, in God we trust. Many governments are doing this. They are removing from within the homes and from within the environments what is speaking about God. He's saying, Lord, stay on the corner and when, whenever you need you, we'll call you. And then you see so many uh, mishaps in the world, so many calamities, so much violence, the world in itself, the judgment of God coming, Man helping the judgment to, to come upon himself with pollution, with everything. And then when things happen, what do they blame? Whose, whose blame is this? It's God's. Because Mother Nature is this and that. The act, acts of God. The world says that. When they have no solution, then they blame God. The acts of God. Firstly, they push God aside, but when evil comes, then they blame God. So now, let's continue. Let's go back to... We're going to go back to chapter 92. So then he was showing to Israel what was about to come. Because of the rejection, because of a lack of understanding of what he was preaching, the people was going to go through difficult moments. And now Jesus begins to speak through parables. 
he says one, there's another one, he keeps saying until he comes to chapter 22. And here, Jesus, through a parable, he says that the kingdom of God is similar to a king that celebrated the wedding of his son. And speaks of a king that was celebrating the wedding of his son. And he had invited a couple of people to come to the party. And those guests, they rejected. Who were those guests? They initially rejected the invitation to be in the wedding. Prophetically, prophetically speaking, Israel, Israel. Because the word says that Israel is the chosen people of God. And now he continues here. And he sent his servants to call the guests to the wedding and they didn't want to come. Israel, because they didn't have the revelation of the Holy Spirit, because they didn't understand what was God's project, Israel didn't care about the invitation of God and about Jesus. The people, before, when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, people were saying, Hosanna is the one, son of David, that is coming. They, these people, it was thinking that Jesus was going to fight with Herod, the same people also said they told to Herod, this, let this one die because we want Barabbas. Barabbas. The same people that, that blessed Jesus now are saying, kill Jesus and bless and save Bar Barabbas. So now Israel and said, he said, she sent all the servants and said, I have my dinner ready. My oxen uh, and fattened cattle are killed, and all things are ready. But they made light of it, and when their way, one to his own farm, another to his business, and they rest, seize, seize his servants, treating them spitefully, and killed them. Who were the servants that were, were seized and killed by by his guests. Th those were the prophets. So then he would say, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that kills my prophets. In the Bible, it says this. Jerusalem was going to through a path that had no way back. And here it begins to tell. And now, but the feast was already prepared. The oxen and fattened cattle are killed. Everything was ready. The project of salvation man was already established. There was no way to stop it. That's why the feast continued. So then when the king learned about this, he was angered and he sent his armies and killed the murderers and burned up the city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So why Israel rejected? Because Israel rejected now the Lord, the project continues. Because nothing will prevent the action of God on behalf of man. Not even Israel, which is the, the people that is chosen by God, they, they rejected, they didn't want what was the blessing of God for their lives. Even so, God didn't go back on his agreement because the project has, had already been established. And now he goes. So he killed the murders and burned up their cities. Here it speaks about the ruin of Israel. Was, and we were speaking last Sunday that on year 70 after Christ, Israel was invited and destroyed. Everybody was was uh, set to run, and the temple was destroyed. Today, there is only one wall uh, uh, left from the temple. It is the Wailing Wall. And there is a mosque, a Muslim mosque, in the place of the temple. And while the, mos the mosque is there, there will be no temple. And that's the great argument between the Israelis and the Muslims, because they built a mosque on the place of the temple and they cannot 
build the, the temple while the Muslim mosque is, is there. They have already purchased all the materials to rebuild the temple. It was a declaration of the Prime Minister one or two years ago. They have, a, have all the material prepared. They just need to build it, but they cannot do it because there is a Muslim mosque there. And what is left of the old temple is just a wailing wall. But now Jesus is telling here in parable, he is prophesying, the parable was pro prophesying everything that was going to happen to Israel with the salvation of man and on and on. And they go to the roads, the highways, and find anyone, invite anyone you find. So then the servant went and invited all the ones they found either good or bad both good and bad and they and the wedding hall was filled with gases and now the good and bad who are these people prophetically speaking they are the gentiles that's what what they are the church now are the gentiles the both bad and good who are the good Benjamin's good, very good. Benjamin, you can raise your hand. Who thinks that he's good? He's not. It's not because I'm in my own presence, but I'm very good. I'm a very good person. Very good. The good and the bad. That we see today. We see people from every walk of life, from every nation, They are coming because they are all being invited. Salvation now was no longer destined to a single nation. It's now expanded to the entire world. Was this God's project? Yes, it was God's project. God was not caught by surprise. No, plan A was Israel, now plan B is the people. Everything was established from the creation of the world. God was never caught by surprise was already the project. Isn't it true? And now the feast, the, fee the wedding hall was filled with guests. It is interesting that now the Bible says the following. But when the king came into, into see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. Interesting, right? Interesting that the king, he enters into the wedding hall Surely, to see the people celebrating, eating, drinking, everybody happy with their wedding garments, because it was it was a, it was a tradition there when the king prepared uh, a feast and the son was get, when the king's son was getting married, people wouldn't have to pay anything, not even clothing they had to to bring. Imagine the women, how wonderful it would have been. Can you imagine? Today, when you speak about a wedding, oh, Lord have mercy, I have to buy a new dress, I need to buy new shoes, uh, 400, I cannot repeat the, the dress because the brother got married the other days. Today is a great trouble for, for women and also for men. But on the wedding of the king, nobody would have to worry about it. Nobody would also have to pay anything to enter the, into the feast because the king said everything is ready the animals have been killed the, the, the oxen and the cattle are the fattened cattle are killed Every, and all things are ready come to the wedding no one had to spend anything everything was paid even the clothing when when they they arrived they could choose the, my size, and they, uh, they try the clothing and they do a little adjustment there. On the, the point was to get into the feast. Imagine a feast with a king like this. You can imagine how much food was in there? Was, uh, was filet mignon? I had never even heard about filet mignon before I came to America. Can you imagine a barbecue? In, in Israel, it must have been a lot of food. Today, 
people invite you to a wedding. My wedding, my my birthday is such a day. Everybody's invited to a restaurant. Everybody paid their own. You know, that's that's what they are doing today. I have my birthday. We are going to such restaurant, and each person paid their own. Uh -huh. And the guests now, if besides going, they have to pay to go to the fa to the to the birthday. I I in in my time it was different. We were poor. <laughs> We didn't have much, but in America, things are different. You have to go, you're invited, and besides bringing a gift, you also need to pay for the dinner. But now, now the king, he gave everything here. No one had to spend anything. He just had to answer the call and, and be there at the right time, enter to the feast, and begin to celebrate. And now the king comes, to see the guests, surely. Maybe to say, oh, uh, how are you doing? Uh, do you like it? And then he saw an individual there without the garments that he was supposed to be wearing. Oh, man. That was a, a great um, challenge to the king. Because, man, he had to be wear, wearing the wedding garments. So then the king asked, wait, wait a minute, where are your garments? You know what he did? He was speechless. He was mute. And when? When the word says that when a man comes to Jesus, when a man is invited to participate in this wonderful banquet and this feast, when man gets gets ready to enter to the wedding, he doesn't have to pay anything. Jesus already paid a high price. Jesus has his blood. He gave his life so that we would have life today. He brought upon himself his, uh, our pains, our infirmities, our anguish, sadness, suffering, and gave everything that he had that was good, which was eternal life. Can you imagine what an exchange? When man comes to the, into the presence of God, man exchanges everything that's bad that he has, he lets go of all this stuff. And there are people that complain still. <laughs> oh, but I'm not going to be able to do this, I'm not going to be able to do that, I'm not going to go to prison, I'm not going to go be able to destroy my wedding. That's what people think that, that they don't want to destroy, it. they want to let go of those things, you know, to accept what Jesus affair offers to men, which is an eternal life. Salvation in Jesus is not there are many things that are involved with salvation in Jesus. Joy, health, peace of mind, eternal life. And then, so when man, man accepts this and accepts the invitation, he cannot go with his own garments. He has to present garments he has received in salvation. And the Bible says that in Isaiah 61.10. Isaiah 61.10. Says the following. Isaiah 61.10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation, he has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. See, what we receive when man accepts Jesus, he receives what? The action, acts of justice. Man receives on the part of the Lord the acts of justice of God. Because what justifies us, what gives us access to God is the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, was his sacrifice on the cross. So when man comes to Jesus, he receives the garments of salvation, clothes of salvation. And now he begins to be transformed. He needs to allow the Holy Spirit to operate on his life. He can no longer reject these garments. He cannot let go of this. 
Why? Because salvation in Jesus is a transformation of life. What I was is already there. Now I am, I am a new creature in Jesus. Baptism with the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the waters. You do this. You receive. You don't ask to be baptized in the waters. You are confessing to the world that you accept Jesus. And when you are baptized by the Holy Spirit, you receive power to testify of what you have chosen. You, your commitment now is between you and God. It's not with the church. It's, it is because between you and God. Because it's the Holy Spirit that is going to guide you. And the Word says the following. The acts of justice of the Lord. Why? Because justice comes from God. You now are, are, you are only waiting for the justice from the Lord. You are no longer going to do what you used to do. You are going to go after people. You are not going to kill anyone. If somebody slaps you, you are going to slap their the other person three times. No. Jesus is going to judge your cause. Jesus is the one who is going to fight on your behalf. He is the one who is going to win your battles. He is the one that is going to justify you. You are not going to go to heaven because you are good, because you help, because you give alms. No, you are going to heaven because why? Because you are having a new life that is transformed in Jesus. You believe in the power of the blood of Jesus. And the justice of God causes you to ask the Lord for forgiveness and justice of God that causes you to pray to the Lord and you may receive from God the repentance. The justice of God does that. The repentance does that. Because it is worthless for you to pray, pray, pray and sin, pray and sin, pray and sin. The sin is the same. But that's, cannot, that's something that cannot happen. When man truly understand this, when man leaves salvation in Jesus, comes the repentance. Comes, uh, you, you end up setting yourself apart from sin. Otherwise, there is no sense for you. You, you will not be putting on your garments of salvation. But when you present to the Lord with your garment salvation, with what you have been you, what you rejected in your life, you will be identified. And now this man was identified but because he didn't have the garments of salvation. So now you imagine, if the Lord had chosen, if the Lord demanded from us sacrifice, imagine. Imagine if God would expect from man a justification for men to go to heaven. No one would get to heaven. Not even through law. Through the law. Fulfillment of the law was, was difficult, was a, a big weight. Now imagine if you, if God told you and said, you're going to be, for a month, you're going to be a good person for a month. Who can do this? Can you? No one can be a good person for, I don't know, three weeks. No one can. Can be holy for two weeks. Not even seven days. To be an honest, a good person that doesn't do anything wrong for an entire week. That is impossible. No one can do this. That's why Jesus gives to us the garments of salvation. That's what Jesus gives to us the cloth of just the coat of justice. Because if you, we were to depend on our own life to get to heaven, this feast here would be a very short number of people. It would be just the king, the, the son, and the bride, and the angels. <laughs> Man is unable. That's why God knows that we do, do not have the means to enter into heaven uh, by our own means. You know why? Because man sinned even with his own thoughts, just by thinking. You don't even need to do anything. Just by thinking you already sinned. That's, it is impossible. Even in thought, man can sin. So then you might th be thinking, oh, 
boy, that's now it's got complicated. Imagine if uh, our thoughts were open so that anybody could see our thoughts. Lord of mercy. Imagine if you if you look to Marcel, you would say, "Hey, Marcel, you th you were thinking bad things." It is impossible. Man cannot remain without sinning. That's what salvation is. This salvation is looking to the target and hit the target, and this is Jesus. There's no agreement with sin. Every other way that would that God would. I'll, uh, allow us to uh, reach heaven would be impossible for us. Only through Jesus. Not even the children. Because man is far away from the glory of God. In spite of the fact that we have been creatures that have been created by God and uh, in the appearance of God and the likeness of God. But we have a, a sinful nature. What causes us to sin and salvation Jesus now is free and repentance is this repentance is repentance when you repent you're saying the following I was going through this path here and then you go the Holy Spirit touches you and then you turn around and you begin to go in the, the opposite direction if that doesn't happen in your life if you are going through a path that is going to lead you to death, you plead, you ask for forgiveness, and the Holy Spirit gives you this means, if you do not turn around, you are not able to reach repentance and forgiveness. You know that? Because you are constantly going back to the ground zero. Man sins, of course. Uh, unaware of it. Because uh, man's tendency is to sin, like I spoke about the children, but living in sin, so then there is no repentance, so then there is no salvation, there is no operation of the Holy Spirit. You understand that? Then you can come and complain and plea, continue to plea, but living in sin, you are not able to achieve the blessing that you need, that we need. That's the salvation Jesus does that to us. Give us this means. This give us give us this access. That's why this man, when he was seen by the king with his own resources, with his own garment that he had chosen, the way he was the way he was living, the way he was acting. The garment speaks about this. The way the, what is sin. The gar the wedding garment speaks about what everybody saw. It was not just a common garment it was a peace garment, but now, now this man comes with his own reason, with his own arguments. But when he is before the king, when he is before God, he will be speechless because no matter what he says, no matter he might say to the Lord, every argument that w he presents to God has no worth. That's why he, this man was speechless. No matter what he would say, there was no salvation for that man. That's why man, when he lives, man in the world lives counting his days toward death. But when man is before God, he will be judged by the word. He will be condemned by the, the law and by the word. And there is no argument. Because what is the argument of the church? If the blood that was shed on the cross... But for this to happen, we need to embrace this. We need to leave this. It's not just about knowing that Jesus died on the cross and having an understanding, the literal way that Jesus died and the, the blood was shed. No, we need to leave this. But in order to leave this, the Holy Spirit leads us to leave this. Men just need to accept the invitation and accept the transformation of the Holy Spirit. That's what is difficult, right? But the, the ones who are allowing the Holy Spirit to take control of their lives and living un, under the government of the Holy Spirit are already almost celebrating the wedding of the Lamb. And the remaining, 
who do not have argument, who have resources and who know what to say, but or that they have arguments, but but their arguments have no weight to God. They will be judged, and they are going to be thrown away. They're going to be pushed out. But the church will be already with the groom because the church of the Lord is the bride. That's why, my brethren, Jesus was in haste. That's what Jesus said, that the understanding of Israel needed to be changed. And today we live a moment in which the Lord is in haste. We live in the last hour. We're, we're living the. Uh, we read about the last hours of Jesus in Israel. Now the church is living the last hours of Jesus and the Holy Spirit in the world. That's why we're in haste to bring these parables, the, the teaching about this, the understanding about this, because we will only be accepted in heaven if we are living with the garments of salvation and the rope of justice. With the Jews, Jews speak about that. What? They speak about the spiritual gifts, which are the resources from eternity to conduct us, to guide us, to instruct us in the way we need to be. That's why there is haste in Jesus' heart to cause men to understand this. That's why today we, the ones who understand the history, what were the parables, the mistakes of Israel, the mistakes of the Israelites, we cannot make the same mistakes. You know why? Because we, if, if we remain in our failures, when, when we arrive before the king, we will be identified and we will be speechless without argument. Amen? But brethren, those words, they are not word of exhortation. They are not here to when I, I'm not the one who wrote this right I'm just a messenger the word is very clear but we need to allow the Holy Spirit to operate in our lives we need to have the understanding and may the Lord operate this understanding in our hearts and that we may not be caught unprepared or unaware. It's impossible for us to be living in the Lord and in the world at the same time. Amen. May the Lord speak to our hearts.
Amen. I'm going to ask a brother to give a word of glorification. Lord, I want to thank you for get once again to be in your house and this open door may not never close and that we may be thankful to you, Lord, for your word, for your mysteries, for your teachings, Lord, that we need in our daily life to understand better your, your mystery. We thank you, Lord, because we don't deserve anything. But... And we are thankful because of mercies. They are eternally a blessing that we receive. We thank you for, for everything in the name of Jesus. And receive, Lord, our, our adoration to you, Lord. Take us home in peace. And may our word may operate, bringing transformation, being, Lord, repentance, Begin, bring a, a new direction and that we may take a new stand before your presence, Lord. And that we may leave salvation, Jesus. And that we may never let go and reject and look back. And that we may only look to the target. And only look to you, Lord. Don't allow us to make mistakes, Lord. But give us strength to withstand the, the attacks of the enemy, everything that we may face in our, on our path, Lord. Give us strength to say no, Lord. Give us authority. In the name of Jesus, I pray on our behalf is a prayer that we say in the name of Jesus. In our name we say, Lord, the wonderful grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, our eternal Father, and the sweet and tender consolations and the gifts of the Holy Spirit be poured out upon all of us now and forevermore. Amen. The church may be seated. Our next service is going to be on a Thursday. So the brethren may be praying for the service. We are going to have a special event in Port St. Lucie on a Friday. The brethren, uh, ask the brethren to be praying. It's going to be a uh, service of glorification to the Lord for the uh, birthday of uh, Brother Don, and he's sick. So I asked that the brother be praying for him. He wants to make uh, this ev evangelist service. So may the Lord use the church, the servants that are going to be there for the salvation of many there that may want and there are in need to hear the word of the Lord. We have early dawn this Saturday morning. And Saturday night, we're going to have a supper of the Lord. It's going to be Saturday night during the service. So may the brethren be praying for this event so that the, the Lord may give a blessing to us. Let us invite everyone. The good and the bad is part. <laughs> Amen. But Jesus saves you if, if it were for, for me, God would not save the people that would vote for, for the soccer team Vasco. The fans of the soccer team Vasco, no. But God is love. Amen. And to all the peace of the Lord.